Hello, my name is Troy and I'm a museum educator at the National Museum of the U.S. Army. Thank you very much for joining us today for our virtual field trip over here, over there, the USO and the U.S. Army. I'm broadcasting today from the National Museum of the U.S. Army, which is located at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. The museum tells the history and traditions of America's oldest military service, the United States Army. And specifically today, we'll be exploring the ways that civilians have channeled Army values to support and uplift soldiers. We're going to look at the United States Service Organizations, better known as the USO, which has provided soldiers with lively places of social activity as well as quiet contemplation to soldiers who may be seeking a morale boost for over 75 years. Let's get started with a short activity. Take a look at the image on your screen for a few moments and answer these two questions for me. What do you notice about this artwork? What is happening in this piece? This artwork was created by a Life Magazine artist correspondent named Floyd Davis who documented war preparations in England. It shows Bob Hope entertaining a group of soldiers somewhere in England. Presumably, these are soldiers who are preparing to head to or are returning from a combat zone. Look closely at their faces and you'll see laughter, delight, you'll see ease, all characteristics that one might not ordinarily associate with a wartime soldier. What this painting conveys is the power of these types of shows for troops. It shows how volunteers performing for the troops have the power to uplift the human spirit, if only momentarily. Another question for you. What are some ways that the nation has supported soldiers? Civilians have shared a part of the Army's burden since the foundation of the Army. And this has included conserving on the home front, ensuring that soldiers serving in combat zones are properly supplied, and raising the morale of soldiers who are serving in unfamiliar places. We're going to look at an artifact here, one from the museum's collection. Think about this series of questions. What is this artifact? What materials is it made from? Are there any symbols or colors that stand out to you? What about the size? Is it large, small, hard to tell? Who would have used this? What do you think its purpose is? This is a World War I Bond Drive costume. So during both World War I and World War II, the United States government sold war bonds to help finance the war effort. This costume was worn during rallies or pageants supporting the sale of war bonds. Purchasing war bonds was a symbol of patriotic duty. The World War I bond drives were highly effective, with over 20 million individuals buying bonds, raising more than $17 billion for the war effort. So this effort, raising funds, is one way that civilians have contributed to national military conflicts. During World War I, again, a number of private agencies provided comfort and social services to American troops overseas. This includes the Salvation Army, the Young Men's Christian Association, and the Young Women's Christian Association. The support provided by civilian agencies during World War I would then build the foundation for what would become the USO. With war looming and a peacetime draft beginning in 1940, both private organizations and the federal government were really concerned about maintaining morale among the troops and offsetting the negative impact of these things on local communities. The sudden movement of large numbers of young men sort of immediately created the need to support troops, especially off post since the small towns near training camps didn't really offer much in terms of recreation facilities. So, with that in mind, six of these organizations came together to form the United Service Organizations for National Defense. The six organizations were the YWCA, YMCA, National Catholic Community Service, the National Jewish Welfare Board, 
the Traveler's Aid Association, and the Salvation Army. And on February 4, 1941, the USO was incorporated and national leadership was appointed. The USO was charged with providing off-post morale and recreation opportunities for America's servicemen and women for the duration of the war. The USO would go on to raise $16 million in its first year, and with a solid financial basis, the USO got to work. With the money that was raised at the national level, civilians across the country volunteered their time to support the nation's troops. Soon, USO centers began to pop up all over the country, not only near training centers, but also at bus and railroad terminals in order to serve the needs of soldiers who were in transit. We'll see an example with the small town of North Platte, Nebraska. In 1941, the town channeled the selfless service and duty we've been mentioning to support the American troops. It was located on the Union Pacific Railroad and was a major stop for troop trains bringing soldiers across the country in both directions for service in Europe or the Pacific. Beginning on Christmas Day, 1941, the town began preparing sandwiches, coffee, giving free magazines to soldiers during their short 10 to 15 minute stopover while the locomotives were refueled with coal. Now, since the War Department classified all troop train movements as top secret, no one knew the time schedules. The phrase, the coffee pot is on, was used as code to avoid breaking security protocols. And without paper products, soldiers would take their cups of coffee onto the train, and at the next stop in either direction, someone would gather the cups, wash them, and fill them with coffee for soldiers going the other direction. The town greeted sometimes up to 23 trains daily around the clock, serving seven to 8,000 soldiers each day. And by the time it closed down on April 1st, 1946, the North Platte Canteen had served as many as six million soldiers. One volunteer is quoted as saying, we'd missed our own boys, but why couldn't we give other boys a send off when they came through North Platte? While there is some question as to whether this was an official canteen designated, North Platte represents the numerous other railside canteens that were run by the USO, which performed similar services for soldiers that passed by them on their way to their next post. Now, in addition to railside canteens like the one in North Platte, the USO also established clubs and lounges at home and abroad for troops. These clubs were staffed by civilian volunteers to provide soldiers with a home away from a home, where soldiers could be away from a military environment. The need, along with the desire to help on the part of civilians, resulted in a hefty construction boom for USO centers, and by 1944, some 3,035 communities had established a USO club of some kind. There were no guidelines for the ways in which each USO center operated. Most were in places like churches, cabins, other clubs, and unused storefronts, for example. It might be a place to dance, see a movie, a quiet room for religious counsel, a desk to write letters, a place to have coffee or a donut, most provided facilities for sewing on insignias, for washing up, for writing letters home. There were lounges for meeting with friends or taking a nap while waiting for a train or a bus. They also made available travel and sightseeing information. And while each club offered some similar services, each club was unique to its location. So depending on the needs of soldiers in the area, each club offered something unique to its soldiers. For example, in Hawaii, one particular USO center was famous for banana splits. The clubs were all very popular. They were mostly staffed by women who volunteered as senior and junior hostesses. They were meant to offer wholesome recreation to soldiers. The senior hostesses were usually married women over the age of 35. They served as informal counselors 
They also sewed insignias onto the uniforms of servicemen, baked sweets, made sandwiches, and chaperoned interactions with junior hostesses at dances. The junior hostesses were meant to provide that wholesome companionship to men at the clubs. They were usually single women who'd worked outside the home in retail stores or in clerical positions. The USO relied on managers of department stores, churches, YMCAs, or other businesses to recruit the young women. The women had to have references, one from a family member and another from outside the home, which was described as a business reference. Now, of course, ordinary civilians were critical, but they were not the only ones. Celebrities and entertainers also wanted to support the troops. Many actors did enlist in the army, but hundreds of others volunteered their time to entertain the troops around the world in what came to be known as USO Camp Shows. The USO created Camp Show Incorporated on October 30th, 1941. The organization was funded through the USO, but it had a separate board of directors which was drawn from the entertainment industry, people who were familiar with show business. Four circuits were developed to entertain the troops. They were Victory, which were full-stage Broadway shows, Blue, which were smaller companies of vaudeville entertainers without facilities for larger audiences, Hospital, which were special entertainment units to military personnel in hospitals, and Foxhole, which were in combat zones. All major entertainment unions agreed to allow entertainers to waive pay and working conditions requirements in order to bring these live shows to armed forces personnel, even in some dangerous places. These shows included some of the biggest celebrities of the 1940s, including Frank Sinatra, Lucille Ball, Judy Garland, Bing Crosby, and John Wayne. They were all looking to support troops the best way they knew how, through entertainment. Some also volunteered for more personal reasons, we see that with Marlene Dietrich, who took a particular risk because Hitler put her on his death list for her refusal to support Germany and for her denunciation of her German citizenship. She performed in combat zones and near the front lines, first traveling to North Africa and Italy, where she was the first entertainer to reach rescued soldiers in Anzio. She was in Normandy 28 days after the invasion, her unit was actually almost captured during the Battle of the Bulge and was rescued by the 82nd. During her tours, she fought off sickness, slept in tents, even suffered from frostbite. But by the end of the war, Dietrich put on more than 500 performances. Camp Shows Inc. gave 428,521 live performances throughout the course of World War II, stateside as well as overseas. When the entertainers weren't performing, they ate with the troops, they visited the wounded, they visited among the troops, and often they performed multiple shows a day. They were dubbed soldiers in grease paint and were issued special uniforms as well as special paperwork identifying them as entertainers just in case they were captured by the enemy. And in order to protect the secrecy of troop locations, USO entertainers were strictly forbidden from revealing their schedule or their itinerary. For example, comedy duo Jane and Joe McKenna were actually captured by a German patrol while in Normandy to perform in July 1944. They were liberated 12 days later by the advancing Allied army. This is just one of the things showing that many of these soldiers in grease paint faced the same dangers as the soldiers they were entertaining. 37 performers died during the course of the war. For example, Tamara Drazen, a Broadway performer, died in a plane crash en route. Glenn Miller was also killed en route to her performance, although technically not part of the USO. These camp show units brought a piece of home to the American servicemen, along with some hope. And on the subject of hope, specifically, we have Bob Hope. 
Bob Hope, the comedian, would become synonymous with USO shows for decades as he committed service to the organization. Now, Bob Hope was an actor and comedian who had performed in vaudeville acts in the 1920s before transitioning to film in the 1930s. Also in the 1930s, Hope took on a new role as the host of the Pepsodent Show radio broadcast on NBC, which was a weekly variety show. It helped establish Hope as a well-known entertainer, and he became popular throughout the country. On May 6, 1941, Hope performed a live broadcast of his radio show at U.S. Army Air Corps Base March Field. This performance proved to be a significant turning point for Bob Hope, as due to his popularity and feedback that he received from the servicemen, Hope took his shows on the road. He took his first USO tour to Europe in 1943. The troupe covered 1,300 miles in 11 days, playing in roughly four dozen U.S. bases. In addition to England, they traveled to Italy and North Africa, the tour lasting 64 days. Following his European tour, Hope toured in the South Pacific, traveling for 13,000 miles in 52 days, during which he gave 80 performances. With that in mind, you can understand why we have this image of Hope's suitcase here. When talking about his trips, Hope would remark, The USO trip had quite an effect on me. I realized that any contribution I was making was minimal. I was offering time and laughs. The men and women fighting the war were offering up their lives. They taught me what sacrifice was all about. Now, in addition to in-person shows, Hope also hosted a radio show called Command Performance from the Armed Forces Radio Network, which was broadcast exclusively for troops overseas. Soldiers could write in requests for particular performers or to hear particular things. The letter on your screen right now is an example of one such request. Another particularly memorable skit with Bob Hope and Lana Turner saw a request made to fry a steak on air so that they could hear it sizzle. We actually have a video of it. Let's take a look. From the bleed of a billy goat to the fizz of a bourbon and soda. And now comes the ordnance gang at 863 with a letter from Sarge Everett Hankey and Corporal Roland Lipton and this little dilly. It says, Dear Command, enclosed, please find peace off top of Stuka Dive Bomber, for which you will please have Lana Turner come out and fry us a three-inch porterhouse steak smothered with onions, and let's hear it sizzle. Just to prove there's no request too large, fellas, here she is, Lana Turner. Hi, Bob. Say, have the FBI men found a steak yet? Yes, it's backstage. But, Lana, <laughs> this is dangerous. If this audience sees steak, they'll come right up here after it. Oh, I don't know. They've seen ham all evening, and you're still here. <laughs> right now, I'm vacant. <laughs> Let's get out with this thing. Be a good girl and let's fry that steak, huh? Okay. Bring on the porterhouse steak! <laughs> well, look, they got an armed guard around the steak. <laughs> hey, oh, look it. Hope continued to tour with the USO following the end of World War II. He remained a fixture of shows for the military all the way through Operation Desert Storm. Throughout his life, it's estimated that Hope entertained 11 million troops, and for his service, the U.S. House of Representatives made Bob Hope an honorary veteran. He received a multitude of other honors, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Congressional Gold Medal, a British knighthood, and over 50 honorary degrees. But of course, on January 9, 1948, the first wartime USO came to an end with this announcement by the organization's president. Operation USO has discharged its mission, fulfilled its original purpose, and ended its task. Through World War II, the USO strengthened the spirit of the soldiers and reinforced the will to win. 
For both those whom it served and those who put forth the effort to make it work, the USO was an integral part of the nation's war effort, an army of volunteers dedicated to the most basic common good, freedom. But although the war was over, the end of World War II did not bring an end to the need that was fulfilled by the USO. In 1949, a framework for a peacetime USO was created, and the USO was back in business providing support to troops. This support has continued all the way through today, with the USO providing the same services for troops before, during, and after deployment, both inside and outside of combat zones. These services include USO centers, like those we talked about earlier, travel assistance in airports, railroad stations, and bus depots, care package programs, internet access, reading programs, and of course, entertainment. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope that you're able to see how civilians have channeled the Army's values to support and uplift soldiers, and know that the USO is just one example of the many ways that individuals have supported the Army since its founding. For more information, please visit our website.